about the National Water Quality Assessment Program, and part of a component of that is our agricultural chemical transport study. This is a study looking at the effects of agriculture on water quality at seven different sites across the country. And today, specifically, though, we're going to be talking about uh, an area in northwest Mississippi, our Mississippi alluvial plain, is commonly referred to as the Delta. And we're going to talk to some farmers, we're going to talk to some scientists, and we're going to take a little bit of a tour of the Delta. So Richard, what have you been working on as far as the NACWA program? Well, for the last couple of years, I've uh, helped out with uh, sparrow modeling that the NACWA program is uh, doing. Uh, the NACWA group has wanted to do sparrow models for various regions of the country, and I, the team that I worked with helped develop a sparrow model for total nitrogen and total phosphorus in the south central United States, and that uh, uh, study area goes from uh, Arkansas all the way over to Colorado, inclusive of Texas, Louisiana, Missis parts of Mississippi. So what does a Sparrow model do? Sparrow model is uh, kind of a hybrid dynamic model and statistical model and it relates uh, water quality information that we collect in the field to landscape characteristics, sources of a particular pollutant, and it also relates it to those things that deliver those pollutants to a receiving stream. And so uh, we calibrate the model with multiple sites of uh, whatever pollutant we're looking at uh, or constituent that we're looking at, in this case total nitrogen, total phosphorus. And then we relate that to sources of those, of those uh, particular constituents, things like atmospheric deposition, uh, uh, point source runoff, uh, uh, other land use characteristics like uh, uh, fertilizer, manure, and, uh, and then how are those things transported to the stream? So variables that, that transport are, you know, rainfall and runoff and uh, soil character characteristics like soil permeability, those things contribute to the model. The model also includes decay rates and, and how these things uh, what kind of losses you might have of these particular constituents before they hit the receiving stream or some target area that you're looking at. So, so why, why was this important to do? Well, originally uh, the NACWA program put together a national model and that particular national model used sites uh, from our old, well from our NASQUAN program, some of which are no longer in use. And there are about, oh, I'd say about 450 calibration sites across the nation for the uh, National Sparrow Model. And so uh, they wanted to, again, regionalize some of this and look at smaller study areas and use not only USGS data and not only NASQUAN data, but also state databases and other databases that we could bring into the model. And so, like I said, the National Model had somewhere around 450 sites and the models that we developed for just our small part of the United States had about the same number of sites. And so they wanted to expand those, and so these regional models were developed for about four or five different regions across the country, our southeast, northeast, upper Mississippi River Basin, Missouri, and the northwest. And so what would be the most important results or the most significant results that you found from this? Study. Well, from this study, as you can imagine, if we stretch from West Texas and, and Colorado over to the uh, lower Mississippi Valley, you're looking at an area from very arid to very humid, wet conditions. And so, um, if you were to draw a line right down the middle of my study area, the right side, uh, the, the eastern side of the study area would have most of your concentrations of cities, it would also have most of the agriculture. And, and most of the, the sources, to be honest, you know, if you're looking at it. And, and as far as delivery terms and things that deliver those sources to the streams, the eastern side of our study area has the highest rainfall, like I just said, arid to humid. And so really the, the results followed that pattern. So the higher loads of nitrogen and phosphorus we saw in the eastern part and also along the coastal areas, which was relatively expected. The one thing that I thought was really interesting was how much of the nitrogen load was contributed by 
atmospheric deposition. It was greater than 40 percent. And so with the other sources of nitrogen and phosphorus, the higher sources came from the agricultural industry from fertilizer and manure inputs. So does this relate to the Gulf hypoxia zone at all? Yes, it would have a pretty good uh, effect there. Uh, uh, the, the hypoxia zone and you know recent studies are, are pointing toward nutrients as the reasons. And so where in the uh, southern part of the United States are areas that contribute, to the uh, hypoxia zone, and we're able to see this as we map the loads for our particular study area. So this has implications of if you want to do something about the hypoxia zone, if we think that it's related to the nutrients that, that hit there, then where do you start as far as trying to mitigate that? And that's one of the, 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 the strengths of Sparrow. The mapping products that are produced will show you those uh, hot areas or, or whatever where you can you know, if a, another agency were to invest money into best management practices or some other source, some other way to mitigate, um, where is the best bang for the buck in the study area? So, um, and then the other thing that we did was there's so much emphasis on the hypoxia zone in the uh, intercontinental shelf of the uh, Gulf of Mexico that's been well documented. Uh, related to the Mississippi River Basin, but there's really not a whole lot on smaller estuaries where hypoxia also exists. So that's one of the things we wanted to provide the stakeholders for this study area is um, uh, isolated maps of the loadings of total nitrogen and total phosphorus for the smaller watersheds, the smaller estuary and type watersheds along this particular study area. Yeah, so that was the other thing that we did. Great. Thanks. Thanks.